Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another one of these things where I talk into the microphone and, and take advantage of my son's nap time to do a video. Uh, in the background is whatever the heck I decided to put as background. I don't really know. There's some news and some not news. I'm not really sure what's worthy of reporting at this time. So we're just doing one of these things to talk about what I've been up to recently. Uh, I'm still having problems with mold. Uh, it's been a real pain. The mold this time is in the bathroom, in the master bedroom, and that's not really a surprise because when I was having trouble with the mold in the first place, a lot of times the bedroom is where I was having the most issues, and I couldn't figure out why that would be. I told the mold guys when they came and they, they looked at it, but they were like, well, we can't see through your walls, so if there's something behind your bathroom tile, then that's just how it is. So uh, sure enough, we've, we've torn out some of the bathroom tile and there was just a ton of mold, so we threw it out, had to hire another round of mold, mold remediation and uh, that's hopefully going to be cleaned up soon. It's kind of driven me out of my workspace a little bit, but not as badly as last time. Uh, it's been better managed. I've got like a, uh, my own <laughs> certified HEPA vacuum at this point, like three air purifiers, two dehumidifiers. Uh, it's been going on for a long time and I have gradually acquired a lot of supplies to try to <laughs> mitigate the problem. So was was not as bad this time. Um, but uh, it, did, it did make it hard to sleep and uh, hard to stay in the uh, office to work because the office is, uh, gets a little humid. I think the window is not particularly great, would need to be replaced at some point. But uh, the humid rooms get really bad, they get really moldy. So I mostly just used the time to do some writing instead, and uh, not like Radio Skyline, because I've been having trouble coming up with what to do with Radio Skyline. Uh, originally it was supposed to be kind of like a fun, you know, we go around the city and we do these things, and I will, you know, talk about this and that. And then we had the, the pandemic and the lockdowns, and now the riots and the, the elections are gearing up and so things are getting more and more political and it feels more and more difficult to make commentary on things in a way that would be fun and uh, you know like like if I bring up a serious issue like the like uh, you know the, the like the shootings or the pandemic or anything like that I can make fun of it to a certain extent but all of its kind of serious stuff and so uh, like there are jokes that are interesting to make or I'd like to make, but they everything's developed this partisan bent. And so, for example, like uh, they had that Chaz thing, and uh, they were planting they planted a garden in Chaz. And I think like one guy did it at first, like he just dug up some land and put in some plants. And I don't think that he expected it to be there for a long time, but it was just like, well, we've occupied this area, you know, what are we gonna do? And so he just started gardening, you know, to keep himself occupied. And, and like I said in the uh, Radio Skyline thing, from the point of view of Hugh, uh, like, I get that. I, I get that mentality. Uh, if, if you had an opportunity to, like, practice gardening in a space where you weren't going to have to worry about, like, oh, you know, I did a lot of damage, now i got to redo this, or i got to tear up the whole garden and start over again. Why not? Uh, it's a golden opportunity. No one's going to tell you. There's no homeowners association. No nothing. That's... Chaz, Chaz is finally the freedom to just plant whatever vegetables you want and wait about uh, two weeks, see how that goes. So, uh, yeah, I thought that was funny. I, I just kind of enjoyed that they did that. But then when I started looking more into it, you found that it was like this rallying cry for the right wing where they were posting it and they were all like, this is what communism looks like. And they're like posting pictures of this garden. So it goes from being this like fun thing to being this this stupid partisan joke that, that uh, just spoiled it for me. And uh, so many things are, are like that right now. And they're getting worse. As, as the uh, election comes up, everything's getting worse. There are, for those of you who didn't understand the last time this came around, there are now, um, I don't know if they're, they're spy agencies exactly, but there are like social media agencies in various countries. I believe England has one now. They have a government, government agency dedicated specifically to like counterintelligence on social media. Russia has had one for a while and has one of the more uh, complex and dominant uh, social media networks. China's got one now. Iran has one. And so if you read like the reports on all this stuff, they talk about kind of uh, all the various nations are trying to control political narratives on Twitter and Facebook and uh, 
you know, even through Google search results and everything else, everywhere that they can, YouTube. So uh, it, it should really not be a wonder to think that this is something that, you know, governments would want to do. Like, this is, this is pretty much no-brainer stuff. If you just have this open media environment where you can go in and just, like, make it to where the top result is always, uh, ruling party is the best party ever, or uh, everyone should hate my political adversaries, then why would people not take advantage of it? There have been uh, cyber divisions for a long time, but they focus mainly on attacks. These social media divisions are kind of new, and the, the whole thing that, like Russia's been doing this, not just in the United States, but also in Europe and other places. And uh, it's funny because Donald Trump became the target of a lot of the discussion about these campaigns. He chooses not to believe in them, and so now it's become like partisan to acknowledge that they're real. Like, as logical as it is to imagine their existence, and, and as easily as you can see the advantage of having them, in the United States, if you're on the right wing, you're encouraged to pretend that that's very silly and it doesn't really happen. But uh, the debates are winding up, the elections are coming, things are getting very political, and there are definitely a lot of uh, instigators online who are intentionally trying to make the internet a worse place. So... Uh, with Radio Skyline being what it was, I was originally going to, uh, like, I would have lampooned the politics somewhat, but it would have all reflected back on, you know, uh, Don Albo and Sabrina Watford and, and everything, but um, once we get into, like, tragedies and shootings and all this other crazy stuff, it's, it's a little less, uh, little, little less, uh, little less whimsical, a little harder to make whimsical, like, you, you can't, you know, I don't know. So, uh, I don't know what to write for this upcoming episode. I barely knew what to write for the last episode. The last episode got like, you know, six dislikes, which, as of this time, which is not a lot, you know, doesn't sound like a lot, but normally they don't really get that many. You get like one or two, and then like, uh, you know, about close to 200 likes or something like that. Uh, this one made more people angry than there were people who felt the need to comment and be like oh no because right now the the politics is that uh, the republicans are trying to paint the the whole all the protests as being something that's like you know it's oh it's a left-wing thing and then the you know the, the left wing is trying to create a rosier picture of the chaos than is actually there and so it's, it's again it's like very partisan there's not really this i don't know admission of the reality that how do I put it? Like, there there needs to be a certain amount of order, and then you'll kind of get, like, some periodicals will be like, well, you know, they're, they're, we're not saying there won't be any order. But if you really just look at the rhetoric, like the defund the police slogan, um, like, if you read about it and you read what's actually being called for, it sounds a little bit more reasonable, but on its face, it, it sounds very unreasonable. And that's because those things that are more sensational and less reasonable sounding spread better on social media, and, and even the news really likes the sensationalism because it, provo it promotes more viewership. So you're seeing kind of a more sensational, like, out-of-hand kind of slogan, and then, like, a lot of sensational out-of-hand blowback, and it's all, it's all very stupid and not in touch with the reality of things. So, um... I don't know. I personally hate it. I, I've, uh, I've started to kind of crack down. We have a Discord server where we have a drama section for discussing politics, and I've sort of started to crack down because we have people who come in and uh, are kind of just like hardliners, and then they want to they wanna share propaganda or whatever, so I've got like a rule, like you're not supposed to post articles unless it's from Reuters or the Associated Free Press or something like that. Something really, something really non-biased, like something really reliable. And then you know, you're not supposed to just, like, post an article. You're supposed to actually share your own thoughts. Like, you have to formulate... Because cause I hate that when people post a Twitter post or something like that, and they're like, what do you guys think about this? And it's always, like, a really controversial Twitter post, specifically chosen because the wording is really vague, and maybe the person, like, what was being said is really kind of stupid. Like, maybe there's a kernel of, of value in whatever the tweet was, but it's still just a tweet, and it's still pretty dumb. You know, you see those all the time, and they cause debates because they're open to interpretation and they're fundamentally very dumb. Like, it's easy for dumb people to understand them, and you, you don't need to know anything to argue with them because they're fundamentally wrong in some way. Like, all that stuff, it's just, it's just inflammatory and pointless. And uh, this has been going on for so long. We have been at this for so many years, and I am sick to death of seeing this crap. So, um... 
uh, we, we had a guy and I, uh, I, I banned him from the server, like first ban on the server, uh, pretty much since we started it. Um, or first time I personally banned someone just because it got into like, I, I don't know, he was just ranting and then throwing around some, you know, like just throwing around rhetoric that I'm familiar with. And uh, we already had, we had another guy who came in and was doing the same thing. And it's always the exact same rhetoric. Like it never changes. You could go anywhere online and once you've seen it, like you see it once, you see it a million times. There's there's no value. Like I, I'm already familiar with it. I don't care. <laughs> so um, it's not a lot of fun. I don't know what to do to pull Radio Skyline kind of out of that, uh, that, that whole like talking about COVID and the riots and everything else. Because if you think about them, like if you look at this, like it's supposed to be that Hugh and Myra are real people with a real radio station and they're supposed to be talking about things going on in the city. Like if they start turning around, they're like, so in other news, there's like a, there's a puppies, you know, fun flower planting. Uh, it kind of gets to be, I, I don't know, it's almost like they're just being irresponsible. They're like, you know what, um, let's not talk about all these important issues, let's focus on these other things. And I don't know how I could justify that because in the real news, the reason why you don't get that is because there's no one calling for it at all. Everyone wants to have their political opinions kind of reinforced or talked about. And the network heads are making more money by doing that. You know, this wouldn't be the way that real politics, uh, that real radio is if it weren't, if there weren't real incentives to do it. So <laughs> the radio skyline guys, I can't think of like, I can't think of a logical incentive to have them not go political and uh i i don't really want to go political it makes me unhappy so uh, i don't know i don't know if i'm gonna try to think of something else uh you know i don't know maybe like a pause in radio skyline until there's there's something to say besides uh gloom and doom um i know that some of you guys are really enjoying radio skylines and so i like i don't want to say like well i'm gonna quit doing it because it sucks i also don't have any plan i don't know what i would what else i would do um but as far as all that aside things i am doing right now um, I've done a little bit of work on that video game. Uh, I started working on tile sets, and tile sets, it turns out, are a massive pain in the ass. Man, uh, getting everything all lined up perfectly. I, I believe that there's software you can get that will help you do that correctly. Uh, I'm using just like standard drawing software, which isn't really designed for that specifically, but it does offer the ability to set up like grids and things like that, so you can see where you're drawing. But if you were like a pixel off, then whenever you draw your tile set, like they'll all have the, you know, they'll all have that pixel mistake. So, um, yeah, I did a couple of tile sets and I put up some walls and then I realized, you know, the walls needed to, like, they need to zig or zag this other direction. And then I have to go through and make another, like, add to the tile set and create these new things. So, um, tile sets are funny because I guess, I guess they save time if you're copying and pasting a lot of things. But in some cases, it would probably be faster to just, like, hand draw a background and it would be more dynamic doing things that way but I think it's considered it's like much harder on on the computer's resources because then you're like importing a huge PNG file <laughs> like every time you go to a new space instead of just using these tile sets so uh, I'm doing my best to get these tile sets done I'm designing like like I've got the room for your main character all set up he's got a little computer he turns on and tells him like uh, you have to go to work, or you're fired, and that's that's how the game will start. You go outside. I've got some sketches drawn up of like the uh, the little city that he lives in, or it's it's not going to be very large. Like there's there's most of it's going to be blocked off to you, and then there'll be like a subway system that takes you off to different places, and that's how you get around. Uh, like there'll be a few places you go to that are in town to get new characters, and that's that'll be like what that is mostly for. And then you, you hop on a, like a monorail and you go other places once you've got all the characters you want to have. So, um, yeah, I've got sketches for the town done. I've got some sketches for like the first level area done, factory. I've been doing, uh, I've got some music put together and I'll sometimes sit down and, and listen to it and uh, make sure it doesn't drive me crazy on a loop because that's very important. Uh, I am not a phenomenal musician, so it's kind of, there's been some steps forward, some steps back, I'll, I'll do something, not like it, throw it away, uh, start over, do it again. So uh, yeah, there's stuff going on with that. It's not a lot of progress and not a lot worth like showing, uh, there's been some programming stuff too, but not really a lot of physical stuff to look at. So, 
it's still being worked on. Not as much as I, uh, not, not as much to maintain the pace that I started with when I was first like, oh, I'm doing this project. Um, but it's still being worked on. Uh, what I have done, though, while the mold has kept me out of my office, is I've, I've been writing a role-playing system. And this is kind of funny because it was something like, I've been talking about doing a role-playing system. You know, everyone, every nerd who plays role-playing games, you know, pen and paper role-playing games, is always like, man, one of these days I'm going to write a role-playing system. And you kind of don't because you know that it's really not going to be worth it most of the time. Like, whatever whatever you want to do, there's already a system out there that's pretty much going to cover your bases and get you what you want. But the reason I'm doing this is because I've, I've got a group that I play with, and they all kind of learned in D&D, and they really like D&D, and they really like their mechanical stuff. But I'm a little tired of, of playing in these very mechanical games. And so I wanted to get into kind of more role-playing oriented things, but not throw out the mechanical backing. Because I also kind of enjoy mechanics as well. I like having sort of a sort of a bit of rule structure underneath you. But the trick is, is that if you get very mechanically oriented players, and you show them all the mechanics, all the machinery, then what they'll want to do is they'll want to open up the machine and take it apart and figure out the best way to put it back together to their benefit. And uh, so, like this this group that I play with right now, these are kind of like the guys that know every trick in D and D to do things to like you know, instantly kill a, a, a Baylor, you know, by picking him up and dropping him or something like that. Like, I don't know the tricks, but they, they could probably tell me if there was some way to cheese D&D &D to instantly kill a Baylor in one turn, or like a, a few turns, then they would they, they could tell me how to do it. So, uh, this group also, too, I get in kind of the problem where um, when I learned to roleplay, I learned in, in more of kind of an acting freeform sort of environment. So for me, role playing was more about being in character and facilitating a story, you know, and being self motivated too, uh, keeping people on rails, like coming up with rails that everyone has to stay on, and saying like, well, first you'll do this, and then you'll do that, and then you'll meet this guy, and then you meet that guy. Uh, that wasn't very common for the group that I learned to play with. We did have games like that. Like it's not that we never played games like that. Uh, I once did a system where I, I sat down and I, I like everyone was some kind of. Uh, Oh, fixer, sort of. They were like they were like men for hire. And so what happened then is that I had these companies that would come in, and they had like I would create a list of different jobs they could do, and then like written down, I had an explanation of like what the job was and what the challenges were they had to do. And uh, and so I would know like what everyone's relationships were. Like I knew what all the NPCs were trying to do, and and why they were doing these things. And then I would just kind of give them the job, and I'd say, okay, this is what you're going to get paid to do. And then it would be up to them to figure out how they wanted to follow through with that. Uh, but the group that I've been playing, like I said, it's, it's a little bit more mechanically oriented. Um, I've had a lot of trouble where I'll come up with all these this background stuff where I have all these like relationships and this is secretly going on in the background and the party's doing this and this is doing that. And then they'll kind of like wait for the next plot hook to tell them where to go. And uh, it's difficult because if there's like you know, everyone's got their own motivations except for the players, then the players are, like, logically bystanders. <laughs> you know, because who's going to come along and tell them, you know, okay, you need to go over here. Like, you kind of have to get an adventuring guild involved, and you'd be like, all right, guys, so uh, grab your things. We're going to the so-and-so dungeon, and we're going to do this. And then it becomes less of a... There's, like, less social intrigue. There's less... Uh, there's really less... It's less complicated. The whole thing is, 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 is less... Uh, it's, there's less role-playing to it, because you're not asking the players to figure out for themselves who they are and what they want. You're kind of just telling them where to go and what to do. And if they fail, it's because you led them into failure. And if they succeed, it's because you led them, into su you led them to succeed. And then it becomes like, you don't really create situations where they could be sucker punched or anything like that, because uh, any kind of surprise is a surprise that you force them into, you know? Like, if you build a trap, and it's not based on a DC check like they do in D&D. And this is kind of why they do this stuff in D&D. Like, if you think about it, uh, if, you, if you had, like, just a pit trap and somebody fell into it, you know, uh, you would just roll damage and whatever. Like, if it were wide enough and, uh, like, a really smart trap would be, like, you wait until someone gets to the middle of the room. And the room is so long that there's no way anyone could realistically run to the other side. That's when the pit trap opens. Everyone falls in, you know, and then you die. And that would like kill all your characters, 
But uh, uh, the way D&D does it is they make all the traps nice and fair, nice and compact, and then they say, you know, oh, roll a DC check, and if you pass this, if you roll high enough, then you don't fall in the pit, and so on and so forth. And, uh, uh, y- you know, you do that because you told your players they have to walk down that hallway, and they have no other option. Versus, uh, you know, in a more open game where players are self-motivated, you can be like, uh, yeah, there's a volcano, and the players can be like, well, I'll go jump in that volcano. And then you don't have to do like a VC, you know, a DC check to be like, well, the lava's hot or whatever. They choose that. They, they jumped in the volcano. And, and if they think it's unsafe, then they don't jump in the volcano. So you leave it up to them and you can kind of be as mean or as nice as you want to be. You just set the world in motion and then react to the players. And uh, so that's what I'm used to. And anyway, though, so I'm, I'm kind of tired of um, like rolling dice and then having people look at the numbers that come out and then count backwards and figure out like, oh, well, this is how evasive this enemy is. Or, uh, or having them like track health, you know, like keeping track of how much damage is done and then being like, well, this monster should be dead, you know, in a couple more hits because based on the amount of damage we're doing, you know, da 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 da. Um, I kind of want to get more into like, uh, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? And also too, like I find combat, once combat drags on for long enough, I start to get really bored. Like, I'll actually get up and go do other things during combat, you know, I'll go talk to my wife or see what my kid's doing, you know, come back 15 minutes later, it's still not my turn, you know, haven't really missed any information at all, because they've been talking about, like, well, you know, if I do this, if I trip this guy, then he's lying prone, and that gives me this bonus, and I do that, and I do this. So, uh, this is a problem with a lot of systems that are highly mechanically oriented, and, uh, and I think, though, if I had a system that was mechanically oriented under the hood, but you made it so that the GM did all the rolling, and, and he just tells you what happens, then at that point the characters are no longer trying to engineer themselves to success. They are just telling you what happens, and they're almost doing pure roleplay, right? So they're just like, well, I do this, I go that, and I go there, and I do this, and I do that, and the GM uh, just rolls some dice on, on roll 20, where you can hide your numbers, you do roll the GM, and so the players don't see the numbers, nobody sees the numbers, only the GM sees, and, and you just tell them, like, okay, so this is, this is what happens. And so that way they would keep moving, and rolling along, and uh, and I've also got it set up so like fights are really quick. You don't have very much health. Gun- it's like a it's a Wild West the game. It's a Wild West setting. So you get shot, and then uh, if you get shot like two or three times, you're dead. That's it. You know, high lethality. So be careful. You know, don't you know you're not supposed to. It's not a dungeon crawler. You don't go from dungeon to dungeon. You don't do these DC checks. You kind of. Uh, you know, you take a job, you figure out how you want to solve the job, you don't think about gaming the system, you don't try to, like, figure out the mechanics or whatever, only the GM sees the mechanics, and then you just, your characters, your players just roleplay. And what's nice for the players is that setting up a character is easy, too. I was posting this in my Discord, and I already got, like, three people who have sent me character descriptions, because they're like, oh, this is easy, you know, like, I get, from a player perspective, I just tell you what my character is, and then you build the character, you know, done. So uh, it should be easy to play with people, like, it should be easy to get players to join in, so long as they're willing to let you build their characters. Uh, Because they don't have to think about anything, except for who are you? Like, what do you do? What type of person are you? So that's, that's uh, one of the important goals that I've set out, is that I want the players to be thinking about who are you, rather than... Uh, what are you like you are not you are not David uh, class warrior you are just David like wh- what does David do who is David and then after that uh, the characters receive experience up to a certain maximum that's outlined in my system here and uh, the experience they receive is based on what they did during the game and uh, they always get combat experience no matter what happened because players like, like even people who are very passive, they always participate in uh, combat, or they play on their phones and occasionally pick up the dice and roll them. You know, they won't know what's going on. <laughs> I feel like uh, when people get really passive, they start tuning out. You'll just be like, all right, what do you do? And they're like, well, what, what's happening? And they're like, well, you're being attacked. And they're like, well, I attacked the nearest guy. It's like, okay, all right, you know, roll the dice. And they, they roll the dice, and they're like, I do, you do some damage. And then it'll be like an equivalent amount of damage to everybody else. You know, they're nothing, they're nobody, whatever. Uh, but with this, uh, with this, what happens, everybody gets their combat experience uh, per normal because everyone's going to be participating in combat and you don't want to have one person who's like really bad at it and then one person who's like just doing the whole thing by themselves, potentially. Uh, but then you get extra experience based on what you did during the session. 
And that experience goes to improving skills that you used or attributes that you used. So that if you did a lot of talking during the game, then your character will start to gain a lot of like persuasion skills and stuff like that. And so you get to be better at persuasion as a result of doing that in character. And so this means that the more that you, you trend towards staying in character and, and doing activities and being motivated, then the more experience you actually get, the better you get at those things. Uh, I do have a little bit of a rule where if a character, if a person's pretty passive and they're not playing, then you kind of secretly give them a little bit more experience. Uh, this is also written in. You give them a little bit more experience for their combat, and then gradually, because they're being passive and they're only playing during combat, they become better and better at combat, faster than everyone else, and then they kind of become the team bruiser, and it'll help them maybe feel like they have a place in the game. Like, maybe they don't really feel comfortable role-playing, but they'll realize that they're the ones who are being really relied on for, for winning fights. And so that way they'll still feel happy and they'll enjoy themselves while they're playing. You know, they won't feel like alienated from the whole thing. Um, and then finally I have, a, I have these little things called peculiarities, which is uh, if your character does something that fits into kind of like a sort of a trope or a specific role, like uh, uh, they they're super paranoid or whatever, then they get a, they get some kind of bonus that's related to that. So for behaving in, in certain ways, for observing certain characteristics that would be person-defining, you also get some little bonuses there, some little, some neat little perks, some neat little tricks under your belt that make you a better character, that make you stronger than, than uh, at those particular things you've been doing. Uh, for example, one of them is, uh, is a peculiarity called Siren's, Siren's Voice which is, uh, if it seems like you're oftentimes stabbing NPCs in the back and, uh, and then you're getting them to trust you again, then it becomes more that they, uh, uh, they're even more willing to trust you than would be normal. Like, it becomes almost a matter of, 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 like, if you betray them, so long as you apologize and tell them, you know, the next time's gonna be better, they just forgive you instantly. And so there's point values associated with that, and that one's pretty cheap, because a lot of times, if you're playing a very persuasive character, you get persuasive enough that, uh, you know, you don't need, you, you pretty much don't need to roll at a certain point, but with this perk, it's sort of like, even the most outlandish betrayals get forgiven. You know, the NPC is like, well, you know, you are pretty great. I guess I'll let it go one more time, even though this has happened a hundred times. I don't know. I just really want to forgive you. And, uh, and so they, you know, you get a little peculiarity. It's just a, it's just a little character trait. That's like, you don't even have to roll to convince people that you'll turn things around. So, uh, yeah, I'm putting a lot of effort into it, working on lore. Uh, basically, all the rules are done. Like, a week of a week of writing, uh, for me, is pretty productive. So I have almost, like, 50 pages, uh, double column pages. Um, I don't have any illustrations or anything, because that would have been really time-consuming, and if I had time to do illustrations, I would have worked on my comic. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, uh, the actual crunch and stuff is just about done. So now I just have to add fluff and tell you what the setting's like, and then I'll, I'll release it. And I don't expect it'll be, you know, it'll gain a lot of traction or it'll spread around a whole lot, but uh, uh, you guys can give it a whirl if you want. Maybe I'll try and post it somewhere else, see how it takes, if anyone likes the idea of it. Um, it's kind of antithetical to the to the D and D experience. It's it's sort of it's sort of supposed to go the other way, uh, less about a lot less about just being. I, I don't know I don't know how to describe D and D, but people talk about like oh you can role play in D and D, like you're able to, but it's not really what the system is for. Like D and D is more about dungeons. You know, you're supposed to go into a dungeon, and then there's like a room full of skeletons, and you cast Fireball. And that's that's the core D&D &D experience. And uh, people can take that system, and they use it to... And they turn it into other things, you know? But the system is, is really built to be in dungeons. And there are much more social systems that you can use, but just none of them are as popular as D&D. &D. So uh, this is kind of, I hope, uh, it's a bit of a... Like I say, it strikes a balance where it's mechanical. But just all the mechanics are handled by the GM, and then the the players focus mainly on role playing, because that's what I really like to see. That's what I really enjoy. So uh, uh, yeah, that's going on, and uh, that's 
that's the news. Of course, there's been a lot of stuff that's come up since the last time I did one of these, but I can't recall what all is important, what all I haven't talked about somewhere else. So, uh, yeah, Talent of Wisdom is coming back this this upcoming week, and I think that's it. So thanks for joining me, everybody. I'll catch you next time.